Do you have justice and obedience? In this lesson, we will learn how to live according to the covenant. Happy Sunday. Are you missing your Sunday school lesson? Would you like to join our Sunday school? Subscribe and ring the bell. You'll be notified each time we upload a new lesson. Hi, my name is Regina Reed and I'm a Sunday school teacher at Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. Now let's get into this lesson. Today's lesson is Justice and Obedience. And it's coming from Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, 1b through 3, and then it skips to 12 to 13. Then it goes to Deuteronomy, the 27th, 1 through 10. So we got a lot to cover today. <laughs> Our lesson aims today is to summarize God's requirements of the Old Testament covenant people. Two, explain the connection between those requirements and the idea of justice. And three, make a plan to be more steady in one area of your Christian walk. Let's start with the prayer. Father, may we recognize that the challenge placed before the ancient Israelites is the challenge placed before us today. May we be more than hearers of the word. May we decide to be doers as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, introduction. There was a story of a kite and its owner. The kite enjoyed being outside and flying high off the ground, but the kite could only go as far and as high as the length of its string. So one day, the kite began to complain about its lack of freedom. It isn't fair for me to be held back by my owner's strength. If only I could break loose from him. I could go wherever I wanted. Soon after the kite's wish came true, the string broke. And for a few moments, the kite enjoyed its new freedom. But a sudden strong breeze of wind came along and the kite soon found itself unable to control its flight. Before long, the wind swept the kite into a knot of tree branches. The briefly free kite now hang captive. The freedom the kite longed for was its eventual ruin. God's requirements are for our benefits. Any supposed limits on our freedom are in our best interest. He intends that we accept his will as our own so that we might become a blessing for the world. This week's lesson highlights several times when the people of God are reminded of those laws as they are called to create a just society in witness to the just God they serve. Lesson context. Now Deuteronomy, the word Deuteronomy means second law. And this is an appropriate title because this book is the second occasion of the giving of God's law to Israel. The first time being to the generations of Exodus from Egypt. Israel's journey to the promised land of Cana had come to its height as the people arrived east of the Jordan River. Deuteronomy 1.1, the previous generation of Israel stopped from entering the promised land, had died in the wilderness because of unbelief. Moses explaining of God's law to Israel and his farewell address to a new generation on the verge of entering the promised land. Deuteronomy can be studied on the basis of Moses' four major speeches. The first reviews the way God worked in and provided for Israel throughout the desert wandering. The review ended in a reminder that Israel was a people set apart, called to live in obedience to God. Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, first through the fourth verse. The second speech reviewed God's law for Israel and provided proper limits for living in the promised land. Deuteronomy 4th chapter, 44th verse through the 22nd chapter in the 19th verse. And Moses' third speech explored the demands of covenant life and the dangers of disobedience. Ended in a call for Israel to commit to following God and his laws. This is found in Deuteronomy the 30th chapter, the 11th through the 20th verse. In the final scene of Moses' life, 
his fourth address presented Joshua as the new leader for Israel. Deuteronomy 34th chapter, 1st through the 8th verse. This address served as that man's commissioning as the people entered the promised land. God desired that Israel be known as a people very familiar with his righteous standards. He expressed that desire in terms of a covenant. The covenant served as the formal agreement between God and his people. Describing how Israel was to live as a holy people and how God committed to making Israel his people. Covenants were not unique to, is, to ancient Israel. Other ancient Near Eastern cultures used similar legal agreements, often made between a more powerful kingdom and a lesser kingdom. These agreements often included a past history, detailing the history between the parties, terms for obedience, or the lesser party and curses or blessings for the disregard or obedience of the previous mention stipulation for pagan cultures the ancient time covenant provided legal example of how parties were to tell one another especially if a power difference was existing throughout israel's history god made several covenants with his people each entail a different aspect of his commitment to his, to his expectations for the Israelite. See Genesis 9th chapter, the 8th through the 17th verse. This week's scripture text describes how Israel was to remember and commit to the covenant God made with them at Sinai. This is found in Exodus, the 19th chapter, the 3rd to the 8th verse, the 20th chapter, the 1st to the 17th verse, and the 24th chapter, the 3rd to the 8th verse. Our scripture reading. So we're going to start off with Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, 1b through 3. Then we're going to go to 12 through 13. Then we're going to go to Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13. And then we're going to go to Deuteronomy 27, 1 through 10. Verse 1. Oh, hear Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep and do them. But the command is more than a call. To hear it challenges the audience to live in obedience to that which is heard. God's statutes and judgments are what Israel is called to hear and therefore obey. Obedience begins by hearing and continues through proper action. To learn them and keep and do God's law means that Israel must accept God's commands mediated through Moses and make certain that those commands direct their behaviors. Otherwise, the true hearing had not occurred. Verse 2. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Now Moses reminds Israel of where they had received God's law. Elsewhere in the scripture, they use the name Horeb and Mount Sinai. Are the, they're the same place. So different people call it different names. This is found in Exodus, the 19th chapter, in the 18th verse. And then Deuteronomy, the first chapter in the sixth verse and the fourth chapter in the 10th verse. Now, a generation later, Moses recalled that moment when God made a covenant with Israel. This covenant reminded Israel of God's great acts of salvation and called Israel to live as God's people in light of that reality. Verse three. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us who are all of us here alive this day. Now, this covenant was not just an event for Israel's previous generation. And you can find this in Exodus, the 20th chapter, the first to the 21st verse. Its condition also applied to their current and future generation. A shared part to God's commands exceeds generations. All Israel was bound by the covenant, even those not yet alive. When it was given, Moses invited hearers to draw on shared memory and live as a people united by the covenant. All right, the lesson is going to change here to Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, the 12th through the 13th verse. And now, Israel, what doeth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul? Having confronted the people with their record of idolatry 
and rebellion. This is found in Deuteronomy, the ninth chapter, the seventh through the 24th verse. Moses set before them a rhetorical question, meaning he didn't want an answer. That forced self-reflection to determine how best to live as people of God. Centuries later, the prophet Micah would ask the same question of Israel. Both Micah and Moses were concerned with following God's law and ways. For Micah, following God's law meant to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. That's Micah the sixth chapter and eighth verse. While Moses had a different focus, their respective answers were matching, not contradictory, meaning they matched, but they weren't opposite. Following God's law implied a desire for justice and mercy. The Lord's requirements of his people are really simple. To fear the Lord meant to possess a humble respect for him. Fearing God was at the heart of the covenant as God reminded Israel, thou shalt have no other God before me. Have righteousness conduct that honors his authority and his commands. That's found in Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, and the 33rd verse. One way for Israel to show this true love was to accept by God's law. Love, love makes it a joy to serve the Lord and the totality of one's being. For ancient Israelites, the heart was regarded as the location of the individual's desire while the soul was the root of life. Serving God required the whole self and required the total loyalty of God's people. Verse 13. To keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Moses closes by stressing the importance of obedience to the Lord. His commandments and laws did not exist to irritate God's people. Instead, they were graciously given to his people for their good. God promised to bless his people as long as they obeyed his commands. This is found in Deuteronomy, the 11th chapter and the 27th verse. So now we're at Deuteronomy 27th chapter, verses 1 through 10. And Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people saying, keep all the commandments which I command you this day. Moses would not be alive when the people of Israel entered the promised land. That's found in Deuteronomy, the 34th chapter and second verse, the 34th chapter, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, this address allows for him to transfer his leadership responsibility. Israel would soon enter the promised land under Joshua. Verse 2. And it shall be on the day when ye shall pass over Jordan into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, that thou shalt set thee up great stones and plaster them with plaster. Moses described a yet to occur ceremony in which Israel would commemorate its covenant with God. After Israel shall pass over Jordan into the land, they were to remember God's covenant and renew their obligation to obey his commands. Verse 3, thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law when thou art passed over, that thou may, mayest go in unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, a land that floweth with milk and honey, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee. The practice of using stones to record law, words of law, was polarized by ancient Egyptians, whereas other cultures would carve the words of their law into wood. Egyptians would paint the words of the law onto whitewashed stones. Previously, the Lord thy God had promised to Moses that he would bring Israel unto a good land and unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Now Israel would see the fulfillment of the promise. Verse 4. Therefore it shall be when ye be gone over Jordan that ye shall set up these stones which command you this day in Mount Ebel, and thou shalt plaster them with plaster. Now this verse repeats itself, and with one exception. That exception is the inclusion of the location where this ceremony is to occur, and that's Mount Ebel. This mountain located west of the Jordan River and north of Jerusalem. 
is mentioned in tandem with another nearby mountain, Mount Gerizim. This is found in Deuteronomy, the 11th chapter and the 29th verse, 27th chapter, 12th through 13th verse. And in Joshua, the 8th chapter and the 33rd verse. Verse 5. And there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift up an iron tool upon them. Israel was to build an altar made of stones for the worship of God. Now, previously, God told Israel that any tool used on the altar would cause the altar to be polluted. Exodus, the 20th chapter and the 25th verse. The prohibition of using an iron tool may be linked to the pagan religion practices of neighboring people, such as the Canaanites. Israel's altar was to be wholly different from altars of false gods. Verse 6. Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. As no iron tools could be used on, on the stones of the altar, they were whole and uncut. This is found in Joshua, the eighth chapter and the 31st verse. Upon this altar, the Israelites presented their burnt offerings to the Lord thy God. During these offerings, an entire animal was burned on the altar symbolizing the complete surrender of the worshiper to God. This is Leviticus, the first chapter, verse 1 through 17, verse 7. And thou shalt offer peace offerings and shalt eat there and rejoice before the Lord thy God. Now, peace offerings burned only a portion of a sacrificial animal. The remaining portions were to be used by the worshipers in what amounted to a fellowship with God meal. This is found in Leviticus, the third chapter, the first through seventeenth verse. This provided a time for Israel to rejoice before the Lord as the meal reminded them of God's presence and faithfulness. This is found in Exodus, the twentieth chapter, and the twenty-fourth verse. Now, these acts of worship were to be acts of celebration. Verse eight. And thou shalt write upon the stones all the words of this law very plainly. The previous instructions are repeated thereby, stressing the importance of the words of this law. This is found in Deuteronomy 27th chapter and the third verse. The Hebrew phrase translated very plainly describes the acts of engraving tool on a stone. And that's found in Habakkuk, the second chapter, the second verse. Now this act was to be completed with intentionality and purpose, not just haphazardly. Verse 9. And Moses and the priests and Levites spake unto all Israel, saying, Take heed and hearken, O Israel, this day thou art become the people of the Lord thy God. Moses' exhortation to take heed focuses on the attention of the audience and draws them into a position of silent worship. Those gathered before Moses were a generation removed from those who had experienced personally, the establishment of God's covenant. As such, this new generation needed to recognize the holiness of this day and affirm their commitment to be God's covenant people. Verse 10. Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God and do, this, do his commandments and his stat statutes, which I command thee this day. As a covenant people, Israel was held to certain standards of obedience, his commandments and his statutes. The Israelites' obedience did not cause them to be people of God. Instead, their obedience was to be grounded in the fact that they were in covenant with God. That's Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, the first of the sixth verse. Conclusion. You are experts in corn farming. However, this is exactly the one thing for which Orville Redenbacher, 1907 to 1995, was known. By the mid-20th century, he had perfected techniques that paved the way for mass feasting of popcorn. Mm. His name and likeness were connected with popcorn snacks. As a 1987 commercial for his brand describes the focus of his work. Do one thing and do it better than anyone. The one thing for Israel was to be their obedience to God. 
and his law. And this was how they were to live according to the covenant. Moses recognized this requirement and it's the main reason rules like obey, keep, serve, and do are found throughout this week's scripture text. A people obedient to the commands of God would have a proper understanding of justice and just living. This is found in Leviticus, the 19th chapter, the 15th to the 16th verse, Deuteronomy, the 16th chapter, and the 20th verse, and Isaiah, the first chapter, the 17th verse. It was one thing for Israel to write God's law on stone. It was quite another thing to practice faithful obedience to those laws. May we write God's law in our hearts and practice faithful obedience in all areas of our life. 2 Corinthians, 3rd chapter, and 3rd verse. And our thought to remember. Obedience to God must remain. If you've enjoyed this lesson, remember to share, like, subscribe. And I've been, you know, y'all know I've been working on getting this course done. And I've decided, I've been meditating and praying. And, you know, sometimes you have one plan and God shows you something else. So I'm going to do something different with the course, but I'm still going to create the course on God's purpose for your life. And I will, when I get the course completely done, I'm still going to do it in December. It should be done by December the 7th. That's my date for me to have this finished. And I will leave a link in my comments here so that you can go there and you can just take the course. So I'll tell you all more about it as I get into it and get, get it out there and ready for everybody to see it completely completed. And um, I'm looking forward to it. So y'all, when I get that link in there, I want you to click on it and go and take the course and leave me feedback. I need the feedback because these will be the first people to see it. Uh, stay safe. Wear your mask. Love each other. And I'll see you all next week.